I have the pleasure of introducing to you guys today a guest speaker that we have with us all the way from the West Coast. Pastor Banning Leapshire is here with us today. In just a moment, we're going to give him a warm welcome. But Pastor Banning Leapshire, he was founder and pastor of Jesus Culture, which is a church that has shaped the culture of many churches in the nation. You've probably been marked by their worship, marked by their anthems of scripture that, that have just like so resourced and encouraged the church in America. And Pastor Banning is a friend of Church of the City. Throughout the pandemic, he actually had a prophetic word for our pastor that carried us through a time of great trial. And so we are so grateful for him, for his anointing, for his ministry, and for the word that he's going to bring today. So would you give it up for Pastor Banning Leapcher? Oh, come on. Okay, this is one of the cooler venues I've ever been in. This is incredible. I was able to speak in England, in York, in a... Uh, tabernacle that was uh, pre-reformation, but this is fun. This is excellent. Good to see everybody this morning, this evening. It's not this morning, is it? This evening. And uh, man, what a joy already. Just so encouraged. Uh, I, I feel like I need to start and just tell you, to adore your pastors. And uh, what, what's happening here at this church is really impacting the nation. It really is. I'm not just saying that. Uh, is that going to be happening the entire time here in New York City? Um, <laughs> It is so bizarre, guys. At night, it's like three in the morning and just honk, honk, and the sirens. It's like, what's going on? But uh, she apologized like it was her fault. Um, but just so encouraged by this church. And uh, what you guys are doing really is making an impact and making a difference all over the world. And so well done. I want to commend you with that. Uh, I came out um, uh, when I realized I was going to come out here and speak. It's Father's Day. And I, I told my wife, I said... Um, Hey, let's go out a day early to New York City. And uh, she loves Central Park. And I said, let's get a hotel right on Central Park. And uh, we're going to get the plaza and then move down to a different one because of the price. But uh, <laughs> do you guys know that the plaza, a suite, is $35,000 a night? Anyways, um, it was a little bit outside my budget. So... So I told CJ, I said, let's go out, we'll spend a day, we'll walk around Central Park, we'll hold hands, we'll look in each other's eyes, we'll sit at cafes. And when my kids found out that we were coming to New York City, they're like, we're coming. I have a 23-year-old who goes to college and lives at home still. I have a 19-year-old in college at home and then a 16-year-old son. And they're like, we want to go. We're going to New York too. So now <laughs> they all came along with us and are jammed in our room. And uh, so the first morning I'm like, all right, guys, we're going, we're going to go walk around Central Park. It was 30 seconds. And they're like, this is lame. This is so hot. We don't want to do this. And so you know what we did? We went to the Friends Experience. <laughs> I don't even watch that show. My whole family watches it. I don't know anything about it. And I'm walking around like, what's that? And what's that? They're like, this is amazing. Anybody been to the Friends Experience? Yeah, it's because in your city, you're not a tourist. The Friends Experience, it's like they've recreated all the rooms and they have all the props to the TV show. It was astounding. So anyways, that's been our, that's been our few days out here. But it's been so encouraged. Absolutely love being with you guys. Do you have your Bibles? We're going to, uh, I told the church this morning that get your Bibles out. And if you don't have your Bibles, find a Christian, sit next to theirs, sit next to them and read theirs. So... If you don't have your Bible, find the Christian around and read theirs. But we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 19. I'm torn sometimes when I come to this place because I know how much your heart is for revival. I know how much I want to see revival in our nation, in cities. I want to see the harvest come in. And yet in the midst of all of that, I also very much just want to see people encouraged. Uh, one of my main passions is, is, is that I believe we're going to see revival in cities it means that believers have to be strengthened and fully engaged in what God has called them to do. And that, and that ultimately you are most alive, you are most thriving when you are, when you are fully engaged in the call to be who God's called you to be and the call to do what God's called you to do. But in that process, the enemy comes and he tries to take you out. And I feel like more than ever, we have to be intentional and strategic about our lives, that we can't just think that we're going to fall into things. We have to be intentional and strategic about my walk with God. John chapter 10 verse 10 describes very clearly the job description of Jesus and the job description of the devil. John 10 makes it very clear that Jesus came and the reason he came was to give life and life more abundantly. 
Jesus came. He, he is not hidden with his agenda in your life. His agenda in your life is that you would be experiencing the fullness of abundant life in God. That's what he wants for you. And the way that Jesus gets you to the abundant life is he connects you to truth. When I am connected to truth, it leads to freedom. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. When I'm connected to truth, it leads me to freedom. The enemy came, the thief comes in John 10, 10. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the way he gets to that is he lies. The Bible says that, that he is the father of lies. It's his native language. That's what one translation says, that Satan's native language is lies. So he comes to lie because he's trying to disconnect you from truth. And when you've been disconnected from truth, it leads you to a life of bondage, not freedom. These are the two agendas that are trying to happen in your life. God has an agenda for you. It's life. It's, it's freedom. It's abundance. And the devil has an agenda for you. And it's stealing, killing, destroying, and bondage. The reason why I mention this is because Paul writes, I'm going to read this in Corinthians. He writes to the church in Corinth, and he says this to them. In 2 Corinthians 2, he says this, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. Or you know, one translation says outwitted, or another one says outsmarted. Paul goes, we were not outwitted. We were not outsmarted. He says, we were not taken advantage of by Satan, and here's why. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. Paul says, yeah, yeah, Satan tried to outwit us. He tried to outsmart us. He tried to take advantage of us, but he couldn't. And here's why, because I'm aware of how he works. I know how he works. I know that what he's trying to do and that his weapon of choice is lies. He's trying to lie to me. And when he can get a lie to take root in my life, it separates me from truth and leads me to bondage, not to freedom. This is the simplicity. I'm going to talk to you about how to not allow lies to get in. But this is the simplicity of what I want you to hear. Jesus is trying to connect you to truth to get you to freedom. Satan's trying to connect you to lies to get you to bondage. We're going to read this story about Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament. We're going to read about Elijah, who saw some of the most incredible miracles and breakthrough, profound moments of God manifesting and showing up. But Elijah wrestled with lies. I'm going to show you this, but he wrestled with three lies in particular. and They're all connected. He wrestled with the lie that I believe these are the same things that we wrestle with today. He wrestled with the lie that God was not with him or God had abandoned him. You know, the reality is, is there's not actually a ton of atheists. And for the most part, Christians don't turn into full-blown atheists. Christians turn into what I call situational atheists. They believe in God. They just don't believe that he's with them. They, they believe that the, the song that we sing in Sunday school, he's got the whole world in his hands. I believe you have the whole world in your hands. I just don't believe you have the situation in, I'm facing in your hands. You have the whole world in your hands. You just don't have my finances in your hands. You have the whole world in your hands. You just don't have my marriage in your hands. You have the whole world in your hands. You just don't have my future in your hands. And, and the lie that he believed that we embrace as well that moves us to situational atheism is that God is not with me and he's abandoned me. The second lie that's connected to that first lie, it's, the next, it's next in the line of thought is this, is that the situation is hopeless. He began to believe in the story. You're going to hear that the situation was hopeless. He actually, it describes it. He sat down. There's a picture in Isaiah. It says those who sit in darkness. There's a picture of people who sit because they've lost hope. When you've lost hope, it means that you don't believe the future has good ahead. When you look at the future, it is bleak, full of worry. And so why move forward if the future is bleak? People of hope move forward. People of hope believe. They have expectation for good as they move forward. And so Elijah began to believe this lie that the situation was hopeless. Not only was, had God abandoned him, but the situation was hopeless. And then the last lie he wrestled with that we all wrestle with is this, is that he believed that he was alone, not just from God, but people. This story in 1 Kings chapter 19, 
is actually after he has one of the most profound breakthrough, victory, miracle stories in all of scripture. When Elijah, three and a half years previous, had prophesied that there would be a drought. It stopped raining, famine is across the land. Ahab is searching for him to kill him. Finally, after three and a half years, he gets up on the mountain, calls the nation together. The nation gathers 450 of prophets of Baal are there. They call out to their God. He doesn't answer with fire. And then Elijah steps up, full of faith, full of faith, believing God that when he prays, he will answer. And sure enough, he did. He said, God, God would, you, would you answer? And God answers with fire from heaven, consumes the sacrifice. They kill 450 prophets of Baal. The nation turns to God. An unbelievable moment of victory, an unbelievable moment of faith. And the next day, Elijah, you're going to see this, the next day, Elijah is depressed and wrestling with those three lies. Let me read this to you. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel, this is talking about what Elijah had done on the mountain, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, we're gonna come back to this, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life. So I, for, no, I, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the, because the journey is too great for you. So he rose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. If you grew up in church, you know this story. It goes on where he gets to the mountain, has an encounter with the Lord, encounters a still small voice, encounters the presence of God. He complains to God that he alone is left, that there's no one else, that what has God done? And God begins to speak to him on the mountain. I'm amazed at this story because I think Elijah was the man. I mean, Elijah was the man in the Old Testament. How can somebody who has met with God at that level? How can somebody who in one moment had so much faith, believed God with all of his heart that he would not leave him stranded on that mountain, that he would respond with fire when it mattered in front of everybody? How can somebody, just a giant in the faith, have victory in this moment and the next moment begin to believe lies. How, how can you go from that mountain experience to the next moment, lies begin to find a foothold in your life? I'm gonna be practical with you. I, if I could just pastor you for the next 30 minutes, it's ultimately I think it's this, is that I think that Elijah got to a place where he was worn out. After three and a half years of not being in his own house, after three and a half years of being on the run and people trying to kill him, after three and a half years of an entire nation blaming him for their pain and famine, the whole nation blamed him. He was the troubler of Israel. Three and a half years people blamed him. Three and a half years he was on the run. And then finally he gets breakthrough. And I think there was a moment when he let his guard down. The enemy's trying to find access into your life. And as long as you keep your guard up, he can't find it. But there are moments when we let our guard down and when we let our guard down, a lie that couldn't find a, a foothold before, the day before, all of a sudden finds access into your life. This is, this is boxing 101. Even if you're just a casual uh, a, a, a spectator of boxing, you know that one of the keys is that you have to keep your guard up. That boxers get in trouble when their hands begin to drop. That boxers train to keep their hands up, to never drop their hands. Because when they drop their hands, 
the, the most vulnerable part of their body gets exposed and all of a sudden the opponent has access to cause damage. So they keep their guard up. I think in this season, and I'm here to tell you this, I think in this season we have to be more aware than ever before of this one thing. Keep your guard up. See, this, Proverbs tells us this. In Proverbs 4, 23, it says this. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Proverbs tells you this. Above all else, guard your heart. You know that we all, have, we all have priority lists in our life. I don't know if you know this because you may not write them down, but we are constantly trying to prioritize things. Uh, you might go to Disneyland. When we go to Disneyland with our family, we are prioritizing in the order of importance what rides we have to get to and what rides don't matter. This is just happening. And we, we better make sure we go to the most important and if we don't get to the others, that doesn't matter. We prioritize. You prioritize in life. You have things that you're going after and things that don't matter as much. And we're prioritizing things. We have a list of priorities for our life. The Bible says this. All those priorities, above all of those, above every single one of the priorities in your life, here is the top priority, the most important thing. It's this. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. It's what matters most. Do, do you remember the, uh, uh, when I know what above all else is, it means that I know what the bullseye is. I know what really matters. We are spending our lives on things that don't matter and then wonder why we're getting taken out. Do you remember, do you remember uh, uh, in fourth grade, fifth grade, we, we did like a, an egg drop experiment? Did you do this in New York? <laughs> Most of you aren't even from New York City. So listen, so, so it was the experiment where you had to create some type of a contraption that would hold an egg and help it. And, and when you dropped it from the second story window, it, when it landed, you didn't want it to break. So people are coming with like rubber bands and packing peanuts and water and whatever else they were trying to do, trying to get that egg not to break. See, if you think the goal of that experiment is to make a really cool looking box, you're missing it. Because you can have the coolest looking box you want. If the egg breaks, you missed the top priority. And I don't even care how ugly your contraption looks like. If it protects the egg, well done. And I think that we have forgotten what Proverbs tells us, which is here's your top priority top priority above everything else. And the Bible, that word guard, it actually means, uh, um, that word guard, it means keep or, or guard or safe, but it, it's translated also watchmen. And the picture is in the Old Testament, there were watchmen standing on the walls of cities and uh, military installations, and they would watch. They would watch for enemies that wanted to come and attack that city. And they would watch for friends. They were the ones that said, something's coming, and it's an enemy. It's a threat. And, they, and, and when that watchman said that, everybody would, would get ready to guard. They would keep the door, the gates closed. They wouldn't open the gates if there was an enemy coming. And they'd also say, there's a friend coming. And they'd open up the gates. That was the role of the watchman. The Bible says you need to be a watchman over your heart. The problem is, is that we fall asleep. We have fallen asleep on the wall. I think we have forgotten that our top priority above all else is to guard our heart. We've dropped our guard as Elijah did. Not we. Such a general statement. The danger in this season is that you're going to drop your guard. And here's why. There's a lot of reasons why I think we drop our guard. One of them is, is sometimes it's just an overwhelming season. I, I call it the cat and the U-Haul season. My, here's why. Uh, my wife, she'll be here the next service. 
if you know my wife, she's like one big chaotic bundle of joy. She's just, she's just one big ball of chaos, and I love it. And she wants every single animal in the world to live with us. And so the amount of animals we've had over our life is insane. And it, right currently, right now, we live in the suburbs. We live in like a house with a, not a huge backyard. And we've got three dogs, a cat, four ducks, four chickens. I made her get rid of all the bunnies. And, uh, and so, so when we were dating, she lived about three hours away and we go down to her house and they live on 10 acres up on the top of this mountain. When she was a senior, well, I met her in college. When she was a senior in high school, she had, she had gotten this cat, this all white cat named him Sal, which was short for Salon. And, uh, and so when she left for college, her parents stopped taking care of the cat and Sal just lived in the woods. And then we would come home and Sal would come out of the woods and just mangy looking, nasty, skinny. we take care of him for a couple of days. Well, we get married, and every time we'd come back, he'd come. And about six months into marriage, we come to our house. Sal comes out, and she looks at me and says, Banning, I can't do this anymore. We have to take him home. No, I don't want a cat in my house at all. And we live in an apartment, so I can't. But, but, but the reality is, I was married six months, enjoying the fruits of marriage, wanted to continue to enjoy the fruits of marriage. So I said, sweetie, whatever you want. I'm in, baby. And, uh, and so I said, I, said, I said, we can't really have the cat in our apartment. They won't let him. She said, I don't know what you have to do, but figure it out. We're taking the cat home. So I called my dad. I said, Dad, can you hold on to this cat till we get a house? He said, okay. So we get this cat, and uh, I'm in a U-Haul. We had brought a U-Haul down, and I was going to drive it back because um, we were just taking some stuff. So I'm in, the tr I'm in the U-Haul by myself, and I get this cat, and I'm up on the driveway about to drive down the hill. And the cat, like, crawls up on me, has its front paws on the, on the driver's side window, just draped over me, just screaming. I'm like this. And the cat's not meowing, it's screaming. And I'm like, it's all right. I love my wife. I can do this. I can drive three hours with this cat like this. I'm about 20 seconds down the driveway, and I just feel this, like, rush of warm liquid all over my lap. I don't even like getting a spot on my clothes, right? I'm like the guy that immediately, it was just so nasty, just all over me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this cat just peed all over me, just unloaded on me. So at the bottom of the hill, her granny lives. We pull over. I'm like trying to somehow clean it up best I can. I got a three hour drive. And her granny says, I was just at the vet the other day and they have a little, a little, carry, bo a little carry cardboard box. Do you want that? I'm like, okay. So I get this cat, the box is tiny, I don't care. I shove the cat in and I put it next to me. I got three hours, put him next to me. About 20 minutes down the freeway, and I'm really not exaggerating right now, the worst stench I had ever smelled. I, I was like, oh my gosh, oh, I'm like, I have my, I'm like trying to stick my nose out the window. The cat, after four years of living in the woods, decided to unload in diarrhea form all of whatever he was eating. Diarrhea in the box and was just thrashing around in there. I had to drive three hours home with this thing. It was I, like driving all the time. Sometimes life is just a cat in the U-Haul season. Like, like are you, sometimes people are like, how's it going? You're like, I don't know, it's a cat in the U-Haul season. Like, there's just, uh, there's just a lot going on right now. I don't know how to describe it. It's one of those things, you know. Sometimes we drop our guard simply because there's a lot coming at us. Welcome to the last two years. There's just a lot coming at us. Sometimes we drop our guard because, because the season lasts longer than we thought it was going to. If you had this happen... You're like, oh man, God, you're, you're, you think this is going to last two months and it lasts two years. The, I, I have seen this so many times pastoring. This is the, the story that I tell around it is uh, the longest I've ever been away from my family is like, I think it was like 18 days or something. I, had a, I, I was preaching in Australia and Malaysia. And, and I'm a guy, I don't want to be gone that long. I get super sappy and melancholy about my kids. I'm like crying every time I'm watching a little car, a, cur, a commercial with a kid in it. And so, if you can imagine this, it's, it's, you know, it's a 24-hour trip almost to get home, jet lag. I land in Sacramento. My house is 35 minutes away from the airport. Somebody picks me up. I grab my bags, get in the car. This is 18 days gone, 
uh, a 24 hour trip home, jet lag, and, and I get my bag and I'm walking up to the door. I, this, trip's, this trip's over. I'm walking into my house. And when I get about from here to that bench, that's my door, I look down and realize I had picked up somebody else's suitcase. Okay, that feeling right there that just goes, like, I, I'm, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, and I look down and realize I'm not done. And that kind of, ugh. I got to go back to the air. It was, you know, it was two hours. I got to go back to the airport. I got to drop off the bag. I got to find my bag. I got to find a lady whose bag. I got to all this type of stuff. And this happens so many times, guys. Sometimes we drop our guard just because there's so much coming at us. We just get overwhelmed. We're trying to find faith. We're trying to do all this. But, and then sometimes we drop our guard because we didn't know the season, when the fight was going to last as long as it is. We didn't know it was going to last that long. And we're fighting and we're in faith and all of a sudden, wait, wait. Wait, is there another month? Sometimes, sometimes the enemy will just keep coming at you in one spot. This is what boxers would do. You know what boxers would do? You got your hand, they'll just keep hitting you until you drop your guard. This is what happens, it happens all the time in finances. You get an unexpected bill in the mail, and you're like, oh, God's my provider, Jehovah Jireh, he's got me. And then the next day, your car breaks down. Oh, but God, you got, you're, you, you've got all the cattle on a thousand hill. The gold and the silver is yours. And then, and then, and then the next day, you have to take a, a trip to the emergency room. And after a while, you just keep getting hit in the same place, and your guard comes down. And when your guard comes down, the enemy now has access to come and lie to you. Lies that would not have gotten in the day before all of a sudden find a place to get in because you dropped your guard. And I'm just here to tell you tonight, listen to me, you've got to keep your guard up. And sometimes you drop your guard not for super spiritual reasons, just life sometimes. So here, here, would, be, here would I tell you, let me just give you three quick things about how to keep your guard up. The first one is this, is never underestimate the power of a meal and a nap. This is fascinating. Elijah, Elijah is worn out. Three and a half years of somebody trying to kill him. Three and a half years of an entire nation blaming him for their problems. Three and a half years of being on the run. He's worn down. God doesn't show up and go, like God's going to speak to him. God's going to give him his presence. But you know what he first did? He's like, Elijah, dude, have a meal and take a nap. And he did it twice. Because sometimes we, we, we underestimate or downplay the importance of physical rest and refreshing. We don't believe that the physical is connected to the emotional and spiritual. As if, if you've ever been exhausted, as if that doesn't affect your emotions or your spiritual life. Of course it does. I, I very much try that when, when I know that it's, it's kind of a season. Let, let me say this. Uh, sometimes I think, guys, you have to get good at being able to assess when you are under fire. And, and what I mean by that is when the Bible says that you have to prioritize above all else, um, if you've ever seen a medic movie, if you've ever seen a World War II movie, you'd run across combat medics. These are guys that are in the fight and are coming to the soldiers that have gotten injured. And they're, they're trained in something called tactical combat casualty care. And, and there's, there's kind of three phases to it. The first phase is care under fire. When bullets are still flying, I have limited resources, what do I do? Then they have the second one where they're out of the fight, but they're still limited resources. The third phase is when they're not in a hospital, but they have some type of a setup. But listen to the description of care under fire, what they have to learn. This is care rendered at the scene of the injury while both the medic and the casualty are under hostile fire. Available medical equipment is limited to that carried by each operator and the medic. This stage focuses on a quick assessment and placing a tourniquet on any major bleed. And it focuses on a major hemorrhaging and airway complications such as tension pneumothorax. In other words, uh, um, what's your name again? Emily. If, if I'm a combat medic and Emily is injured in battle, 
when I come to her and there's bullets flying everywhere, I have to be able to quickly assess what matters most. What matters most? Because if, if she has a, a broken ankle and I'm tending to that, but she also can't breathe, her ankle doesn't matter. We'll deal with it later. What matters is not breathing. If she's got a dislocated shoulder and I'm working on that while she's bleeding out. So, so they're trained to quickly assess what matters in this moment. There is, there is fire, there is pressure, there's thing, bullets all around. What matters in this moment? Bleeding out and can you breathe? We'll deal with the rest later. My point is this, is, is that we have to be able to assess when it is under fire. I cannot tell you how many times I've run into believers who, who have either walked away from church, walked away from their marriage, walked away from the faith, walked away, from, fallen into bondage, whatever else it is, because in a season of being under fire, they didn't know how to assess quickly. There's only one thing that matters, guard your heart. So, so when I say don't underestimate the power of a meal and a nap, for me, when I feel things are under fire, I will make sure that I'm actually getting sleep. As charismatics, and listen to me, I, I am a diehard, I love, I, I, mean, I believe in fasting, I believe in prayer. But what's interesting sometimes is, is when you're under fire, we're like, you know what you need to do? You need to get up, not get a lot of sleep, and pray, and then you need to stop eating food. And I believe in that. But sometimes I'm like, you know what you need to do? You need to sleep more and you need to get some food. That sometimes the spiritual thing you can do is actually know what it is that brings refreshing to your life. My wife, when, when I was youth pastor, and, which is hard work. You have to hang out at Starbucks and play foosball. And I would come home after a long day of youth pastoring and my wife would meet me at the door with a baby and she'd be there with these hollow eyes and this disheveled hair and she'd be just holding the baby and I'm like what I'm like woman I had a long day too and she, she'd be like bathroom did you go to the bathroom by yourself today I'm like yeah a few times she goes yeah I didn't and you know what she would do she'd give me the baby she'd walk out the door and she'd go to Target and, and then, this is what she would do at Target. She would go over to like the little food area and she would, she, true story, she would get a hot pretzel and then she wouldn't even buy anything. She would walk around Target eating a hot pretzel. People from our church would run into her at Target, walking aimlessly around tar Target just eating a pretzel. I, I, I don't know what your Target and hot pretzel is, but you have permission to do it. Don't downplay it. We have to, this stuff matters. And, 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 and I, I've just seen so many people that when they're exhausted, all of a sudden they start believing a lie about their marriage. They start believing a lie about community. All of a sudden, uh, uh, offense and toxic things and all this stuff comes in. Here's the second thing. Second thing is this, is that, is that you, you have to stay, you have to stay connected to his word. I, I'm talking about the word, the rhema word and the logos word. I, that, that there has to be something in you that retreats to hear his word. I, I found for me, David prays this in the Psalms. He's like, don't be silent to me. He says, if you're silent to me, I'm like one that goes to the pit. There's got, there's got to be a cry that says, God, I have to stay connected to your voice. And here's why. Because his voice and his, his word is truth. In Psalms chapter 91, verse 4 through 5, it says this. His truth shall be a shield and a buckler. It's, um, a buckler is like a shield that connects to your arm. So it talks about his truth will be a shield, it'll be a buckler. And, then, and, and because of this, it says this, you shall not be afraid of the tire, terror by night, nor of the arrows that flies by day. That arrow concept is lies that are coming at you. In the context of this verse, it's talking about truth is the thing that will protect you. And so I have to stay connected to his word. 
I have to stay connected to his voice. I have to stay connected to his word. I have to stay connected to truth because truth is the thing that is going to guard me from arrows that are trying to find access into my life. And guys, I want to tell you this. You cannot believe a lie one day and the next day believe it. This is the craziness of it. And so, so I have to stay connected. And, and this would be my challenge. Philippians talks about meditating on all things that are good and right. And you know the passage. It's talking about meditating on this thing. Part of my concern right now is, is that you, you have to discipline yourself in this culture to stay connected to his word. And, and here's why. Because you live, in an, you live in an era where you are being bombarded with voices that are trying to define truth for you. The, the, um, when, I don't, when I don't stay connected to his word, you know, John, John 17 says this, sanctify them by your, by your word by your truth. Your word is truth. It doesn't say that your word is true. It says your word is truth. And here's, here's why that matters. Because if we say his word is true, we say, well, how do you know it's true? And you have to, you have to measure it against truth. But his word is not measured against truth because it is truth. It's truth. Everything else is measured against the word. Uh, who has an actual Bible? Can I have your Bible real quick? When I was a, when I was a kid, um, I, I broke, it's, it's a stupid story, but I was, we were in seventh grade in a gymnasium running off of these six foot tables trying to dunk. And, and I tried to dunk and slipped and broke my wrist. So when you go in, they give you an x-ray. And they, they, they bring the x-ray in, but you can't see really what's on. The, you can't see clearly what's on the x-ray. So they, they turn a light board on, and they put it up on the light board. And when they put it up on the light board, you can see clearly what you're looking at. The word of God is the measurement for everything else. That's why we submit to the word of God. We submit to the word of God because it's the light board. And if I want to determine if something is true, if I want to determine if something is true, I measure it against scripture. I have to put it up because I can't see if it's true or not true until I put it up against the light of scripture. Here's the reason why this is important. Because the, the uniqueness of our age, our age, the generation we live in is not unique because we're going through a hard time. Generations before us have gone through difficult times, in many ways more difficult than what we're experiencing. What's unique about our generation is the amount of voices that are coming at you every single day. The amount of information that is being flooded to you. Guys, my, my grandparents' age, you know how they got information? They woke up in the morning, walk, walked outside their front door, uh, grabbed the newspaper, sat down, read a couple of articles while having breakfast, went to their work, had a conversation or two, came home, watched the night news. Guys, you have more information and there are more voices coming at you before you get out of bed when you grab your phone than, than my grandparents had in a whole day, a whole week. Here's why this is so important. If I am not anchored, connected to, at a deep level, the Word of God, what I don't realize is Every voice out there is trying to define truth for me. They're trying to tell me what's true and what's not true. And if I'm not anchored to the word of God, I have no way of sifting and filtering through the amount of voices that are coming at me. And so, so if I'm going to guard my heart, the Bible says that truth is a shield. Truth is a buckler. I have to be connected to truth. 
And when I am not connected to truth, and this is the problem, we are consuming so much information. Can I just tell you this right now? Can I tell you that you have absolute permission to unplug? Jesus was consistently withdrawing. You have to withdraw. We are addicted to this stuff. Am I allowed to challenge you on this? Uh, you are addicted. We, we, we are addicted to information and to voices. You, you just need to unplug. You don't need to know everything that's going on all the time. You, you need to take real breaks where you just unplug with the goal of, this is, this is what fasting is. Fasting is not just letting go of something. It's letting go of something so that I can better grab hold of something else. So there are times when you say, I'm going to fast. I'm going to disconnect from the voices of this world. News, social media, the constant. I'm going to disconnect from that because I, I need to make sure that my heart is connected to truth. This is why I'm talking about intentionality. The, in, I'm just telling you right now, he's trying to lie to you. And Paul goes, oh, he, he, listen, he, didn't outs he did not take advantage of us because I know what he's trying to do. And so, so we just go, I'm going to disconnect and I'm going to make sure that I am connected to the word of God. I'm connected to his voice. And that everything is being filtered through that. I'm talking about everything we're dealing with in society and everything personally. People all the time, they can come up and go, uh, you know, whatever. Well, they may not tell me, you know, uh, women in this room, I'll just tell you right now, the women in this room, the lies that are coming at you around body image, I don't know if you realize it, it is nonstop, full out assault. Every, every article you read, every picture you see, it is communicating to you, you aren't beautiful and you're not worth it unless you buy something or do something or wear something. And so we begin to believe lies. And I just go, well, I would go put that up against the word of God. Jesus, I don't feel beautiful. Well, you, you've got you to go find out. I put that up against the word of God. That's truth. See whether it's true or not. One of the reasons why we believe lies is because we're such a feelings generation. We're like, I don't know, it feels true. Feels true. Feels like that's what Jesus would do. Feels like, and we're like, listen, all that's out the window. I want to know what Jesus says. Freedom is not found in my feelings. Freedom is found in truth, and truth is the word of God. All right, I'm not going to belabor this, but you, are you with me on this? We've, we've got to have that shield. So many people, because they're not connected at an intimate level with the word of God, don't have a shield up. And so they're wondering, like, dude, why, 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 why do I keep getting taken out with lies? Well, because you've got to put a shield up. You've got to have truth. So, so one, don't, estimate, don't underestimate the power of a meal and nap. Stay connected to the word of God. But here's the third one. Don't leave community behind. Uh, th this, is a, this is an interesting one because Elijah leaves his companion, leaves his servant to walk a day's journey to complain to God about how he's all alone. Because Elijah wanted to have a pity party, but pity parties are only have one person. So he leaves this guy to walk a day's journey to go, God, I'm it. I'm all alone. There's nobody else. Everybody's abandoned me. I, ca I cannot tell you how important community is when it comes to guarding your heart and guarding yourself from the lies of the enemy. It's massive. The Bible says that there's safety in a multitude of counselors. And so when I am surrounded by people... I am safe. When I am by myself, I'm unsafe. Isolated people, this is what happened to Elijah. He got isolated and he got discouraged. See, one of the things you have to realize is this. Anytime you're discouraged or anytime you're hopeless, it's connected to a lie. If you, I, I, I'm not talking about your whole, I'm talking about if you are discouraged in any area, if you feel hopeless in any area, 
somewhere you're believing a lie. And almost always that lie is that God is either not with you or he's not for you. I remember I was, I was just so discouraged by my finances one time and the Lord just said, don't ever approach your finances as if I'm not with you. See, I'm discouraged when I face my finances. I'm discouraged when I face my future. I'm discouraged when I face my health. I'm discouraged when I face, face whatever if I think I'm by myself on it and God's not with me. So, so, so when I get isolated, discouragement, hopelessness, this stuff sets in. But when I'm surrounded by people it's a natural guard to those lies of the enemy because there are people that will begin to speak truth. Sometimes we need the faith of others. Do you know that when they let the paralytic down, the four friends tear the roof off and they let the paralytic down, it says that when Jesus saw the faith of the friends, it wasn't the faith of the paralytic. It was the faith of his friends that got him healed. And sometimes it's the faith of my friends. It's the, it's, it's the truth that they're speaking to me. And when I disconnect from them, I'm disconnecting from the very thing that is going to protect my heart from lies coming in. We need friends. I, you know, uh, 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 Becky Johnson, who is um, the executive pastor of our church, who's youth pastor, she's been with us for 12, 13 years. And when she was first starting out with us, you could tell she had an anointing to preach, a gift to communicate. She was passionate about the word of God and she had leadership on her life. So I began to put her on the platform just to like close worship and prayer, things like that. And we'd be at a conference with thousands of people. She'd be 23 and I'd throw her up there and say, go, 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 go pray. She's so nervous. She didn't grow up in church at all. She didn't go to youth groups. She doesn't know any of this stuff. So she'd get up there. She'd come off. She's, a, she's an Enneagram one. So, you know, nothing is good enough, at, right? Nothing is ever perfect. And, um, and she comes, she'd come off the stage. I'd be like, Becky, how'd it go? She goes, I don't think it was that good. Nobody's alive or touched. It wasn't powerful. I'd be like, hold on a second. Is that what Jesus is saying? She's like, well, I don't know. And so I started implementing something called the Jesus timeout. I'm like, well, young lady, you have five minutes. And I would really make her do this. You have five minutes to go stand over there and ask Jesus until he tells you. And then come back here and tell me what he said. You have five minutes. You're in a Jesus timeout. You go find out what Jesus has to say about this situation. So she'd go over. I still make her do it. She'd go over there and she'd be over there in the corner like this. <laughs> she'd come back. I'd be like, what did he say? He said it was powerful, really good, and lives were changed. <laughs> well, then that's what we're going to go with, because that's the truth. And sometimes you just need friends that are around. You're like, I don't think I'm ever going to get out of debt. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's Jesus saying about your finances? I don't know. Well, listen, young man, you got five minutes to go into Jesus' time out and find out what he's saying about it. Don't come, like, like, we need people around us. I'm always confused. You know, you need to pick up the phone. When you, when, 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 when attack is coming, not just when it's coming, but hear me on this. It's one of the best ways to protect yourself from the lies of the enemy is to pick up the phone and make a, and call somebody. I had a, uh, I go, I used to um, speak every year or every other year at a big youth conference in Colorado Springs. And I remember I was going to go out there and speak, and I got a phone call from um, Corey Asbury. He was the worship pastor. Corey Asbury wrote Reckless Love. Corey calls me and says, hey, after your session, we're putting together a worship leaders versus preachers basketball game. You want to play? And I'm like, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, like I love basketball and competition is like at the top of my strength finders. I'm like, absolutely. Not only that, this is back when all the worship leaders were like super skinny jeans and like deep v-necks. I'm like, yeah, sure, absolutely, guys. I'm, I'm sure we'll do fine. And uh, so, so we get out there and Corey's just talking. Every time I pass him in the hallway, he's, talk he's just talking about how they're going to win and all that. So we get out there the first night. I mean, I, I get done preaching. We go out at 11 o'clock at night. It's Colorado Springs. I cannot breathe at all, but I'm playing. And the preachers, 
got whooped. Like we got embarrassed. We got worked. The worship leaders killed us. I think they won every game. I go home, just depressed. <laughs> My wife's like, how's the conference? It sucked. <laughs> services weren't powerful. No, services were fine. But, but we lost worship leaders. So about a month later, I get, a, I, I, I get another invitation to go back out the following year to speak at the conference. Corey gets a hold of me. Banning. Worship leaders, preachers, round two. I'm like, absolutely. I immediately pick up the phone and I call a friend, Brandon. He was the point guard for UC Berkeley. <laughs> he was the point guard for Cal, Pac-12, D1. Played overseas a little bit. I said, Brandon, how you doing, man? I said, uh, you've been on my heart recently. <laughs> I, I said, I said, I've been, I've been thinking about you, Brandon. You've really been on my heart. He goes, oh, that's so cool. I'm like, we got to catch up sometime. I said, I said, you know, I mean, I would, you should go on a ministry trip with me sometime. He goes, I, I would really love that. I'm like, you know, I'm going to Colorado Springs this summer. Oh, Brandon, God's doing good stuff amongst young people in Colorado Springs. You should come with me. He goes, I'd love that. So I bring him with me. I'm like, maybe bring your shoes just, just in case we get a run in. So, so I bring him out. He's my ministry assistant. I get up that night to preach. I don't know. I, it was five minutes. I, I, I wasn't there to preach. I'm like, listen, kids, read your Bible. Go to a Christian club. Uh, um, and... Uh, we get out to the game that night, playing multiple games all night. One of the best nights of my life. We <laughs> killed them, crushed them. I mean, just embarrassed them. And I'm not even sure I took a shot all night long. I'm like, Brandon, you should shoot a three. Brandon, you should go to the hole. Brandon, you should keep scoring. <laughs> it, was just, it was amazing. I go home, CJ's like, how was the conference? Oh, phenomenal. God moved. It was powerful. <laughs> outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm not a dummy. I, I, I may show up and get beat once, but I have friends that are ballers. I got friends that are ballers. Why would I show back up to that situation by myself? Why would I show back up to that situation all by myself when I got friends? And if Brandon wasn't available, I got, a, I got about five more that I'm going to call and say that they were on my heart. <laughs> and we should do a trip together. Guys, this is one of, one of, one of the ways, one of, lies, I, I've just seen it again and again and again and again. When um, there's two guardrails in our lives, I'm, I'm going to be done now. I'm going to pray over a couple people. But there's... So if you can imagine this, if you can imagine a bridge uh, uh, like 100 feet in the air, and let's say it's like five feet wide, and it has no rails, no guardrails. I'm walking across that pretty, pretty timidly. I'm probably not walking. I'm, I'm, I'm crawling across that thing. But the minute you put guardrails up, there's a level of freedom that comes now. There's a level of freedom that comes. And those two guardrails in our life is the word of God and community. And people that have been taken out. I, I need you to hear me on this because I, 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 I'm, I'm sober about this. And I want you to hear this. People that have been taken out in their faith. People that go through real discouragement. People that have believed lies. One or both of those guardrails have come down. When we begin to diminish, dismiss, disregard the Word of God, when we begin to dis diminish, dismiss, disregard community, we're in trouble. But when those things are up, th there's a protection, there's a freedom Arrows may be coming, but I'm protected. The Word of God, the people of God. 
There's a lot of reasons why the enemy, how the enemy will get you isolated. Offense, hurt, lazy, pride, shame. Shame's a big one. Some of you men in this room, you don't have to be prophetic. You have to walk through New York City for three seconds to, to know that there's an onslaught of sexual sin that's trying to get at you. You don't have to be a prophet to know that men are struggling with this stuff and what the enemy gets us isolated because we're embarrassed and we're shameful. We feel ashamed and so we, we kind of isolate away. And there, you gotta declare war against isolation. And you, you, have, you have to make this thing that, that if I'm gonna guard my heart, this is the top priority. I'm gonna guard my heart. I'm gonna put a shield of his truth. I'm gonna surround myself with community. I'm going to actually take time to unplug and refresh. These are the things that I'm going to implement into my life because I want to step into the fullness of what God has for me because I wanna be a person of faith. I wanna make a difference. I wanna make an impact. I wanna live a free life. These are the things that have to be in there. And this is, this, is, this is not a season to be careless in your Christianity. It's a season to be careful, it's to be full of care, full of intentionality. I'm intentional. I'm gonna get with some friends and say, let's, let's be intentional about our walk with God. We're gonna read the word and we're gonna get together and we're, we're gonna be in his presence. We're gonna challenge one another. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that we're unplugging disconnecting. I want to uh, pray for everybody, but can I, I just want to pray for a couple people real quick. Um, uh, the girl in the green that's three rows back, second in, yeah, that's you, stand up. What's your name real quick? What's your name? Carissa. Will you guys just get Pentecostal on me for a second? Stretch your hands out. Stretch your hands out. This is what I saw. I saw it like, um, I just felt such the tenderness of the Lord over you in regards to things that were in your heart. I saw like the Lord like just really caring about and tender with things that you've been carrying in your heart. And, and I saw that they were fragile, not fragile like uh, weak, but fragile like seed form. Like I saw that there were things in your heart that were in seed form that haven't fully taken root yet. And I just saw the tenderness of the Lord taking care of them. I saw the tenderness of the Lord paying attention to them. I just felt like you were to, to know that the Lord really does see what's in your heart. He really does care about those things. And, and he's, he's, um, he's tending to them, he's caring for them. And, and I just saw that the journey that you're on is about trust. Uh, the, the Lord just told me that if, if there was to be uh, uh, if, if there was to be a book written about the first part of your life, it would be a book about trust. It would be a book about the journey of trust. I saw that trust has been under attack. I saw that, that the enemy has come after that issue of trusting the Lord in so many ways. And, and, that, and that many times it's scary, but I just saw that the Lord was, I just heard the Lord saying, you can trust me, you can trust me, you can trust me. And, and I saw that there are real dreams. You're just a dreamer. I, I, I think that many of your dreams are in seed form, but you're a dreamer at a high level. And, and, and you have dreams, and, and it's this kind of like extravagant dreams, things that you hold dear to your heart and I just saw I just heard the Lord say she's a dreamer and and she will trust me with those dreams and uh, I, I just think that the Lord is just such a father to you and uh, is just covering you I, I saw the Lord really covering you in this season like uh, like a father covering you. I don't fully know exactly how, but I just saw that the Lord was a father in your life who was covering you and protecting you. There's a story in the Old Testament about Sarah, and, and uh, a, um, a king was trying to take advantage of Sarah, and God just showed up and said, you better not touch her, or I will kill you and your entire household type thing. And, and, and there was just terror, and there was this thing of like, he was protecting Sarah in this way. And I just saw the Lord doing that with you. I just saw like this, like, 
like um, real intense kind of fatherly, like you better not touch her. Uh, uh, she belongs to me type thing and, and that you can trust that. And I think that there's been a real wrestling around trusting that, but the Lord's going to do that. So Father, we just say thank you for that. Thank you for the dreamer, Lord. We just pray more dreamers, God. I just, I just pray even in this church, may she just be a first fruit of just dreamers that you're raising up in this environment in the name of Jesus. Uh, L.A. Hat, all the way in the back right. In the L.A. Hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you. Stand up real quick. What's your name? Okay. And uh, who's next to you? That's your sister? Okay. I, I want to say something to her real quick. But, but I just saw over you, and it was interesting, that there's a real creativity thing over you. I, I don't know if it has, it's not really, it could be art. It's not really art, necessarily artistic, but there's a creative thing that has to do with creative thinking. Uh, I just saw like real creative thinking, out of the box thinking, like the ability to solve problems and solutions. Like, like where some people are stuck because they can't see it from a different angle. Like God's given you a gift to see from multiple angles. God's given you a gift to kind of step outside of the way everybody else is viewing that situation. And you, so therefore you're coming with different solutions and you're coming with creative solutions. And I saw like innovation, creativity, problem solving solutions. There's just a real creative mind on you. And, and, I, and I think the Lord's going to really use that in a certain way. Not just that he's highlighting that, but I think the Lord wants to reveal to you how that's directly tied to what he's called you to. Like, I, I feel like you're on a journey to discover what your call is. I feel like you're a journey, you're kind of on a journey just to discover, God, what is it that I'm to give my life for? What's the mandate fully? I feel like he's shown you pieces, but hasn't shown you the whole picture yet. And I feel like some of this thing of the, that, that kind of creative, innovative solution thing is part of that. I just saw that you're a hope giver, that you give hope to people, that, you're, that, that people that want to give up you come along and give them hope. That you're the guy that when people, uh, I saw you, the guy like, uh, you know when people are at the end of a race and they just don't think they can make it and they're dragging along and then you see some guy running out from the crowd and running alongside them, like that's you. Like I just saw you coming alongside people who wanted to give up hope, people who had been in a fight for a long time, people that were discouraged, and I saw you just coming giving hope to them. And, um, and, and not just hope, but ideas. Like, like I saw, um, I just saw hope and ideas. Like not only were you just giving them encouraging words, but you were actually giving them ideas on how to get unstuck, ideas on how to get to the next level, ideas on kind of how to get further in what they were doing. Uh, um, are, are you married? Okay, um, I just want to say this. I don't want to. This isn't necessarily about kids, but but there's just a real father thing on you too, and 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 there's just a real there's there's just a real father thing on you, and I would just go ask the Lord about that thing. And then is that your sister next to you? Did you say, yeah. Um, you know what I saw for you, and this real this real simple. I saw I saw a cloudy. I saw the sun breaking through the clouds, and I felt like I was just to tell you this right now, there's a new season that's begun. There's a new season that's begun, and there's been a cloudy season over you, but that sun is about to break through, and those clouds are going to be forgotten. And I really believe that the last season is gonna be a forgot, it's gonna be a distant memory because of what God's about to do. And the sun has broken through, and I just feel like, well, I just feel like I'm supposed to declare this over you. I think it's already happened, but I'm not sure you believe it. And I just feel like we just, as a community, just wanna tell you this, there is a new season that's upon you. And I feel like God is asking you to live like it, to step out like it. Even though circumstances may not have shifted fully, there's a new season that's on you and you have permission to live like there's a new season on you. You have permission to live like the sun is out. You don't need to bring an umbrella anymore. The, the clouds are no longer over you. There is no more rain. You can put your tank top on, you can put your summer clothes on and you can walk and live like that because the sun is out and it's not going away. And I feel like you felt the sun out, but you're not quite sure if you can trust it. You're not quite sure if it's teasing you a little bit. You know, the sun comes out for a day and then it goes away. And the Lord just said, the sun's out. You don't have to worry about that now. The sun is out and you can trust it. I saw, like, I saw, do you know a tumbler lock? I don't, but I saw like a, a shift that just happened. And it was like the last thing fell in place for the door to open. It was like things have been falling in place, but that last thing just happened. I don't know when it happened. I feel like it was just a couple weeks ago that something shifted. I don't know why. But, but we just bless you with that in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. <laughs> One more thing real quick. Um, 
uh, uh, maybe they left. Uh, no, no, right here. Uh, the girl in the black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand up. What's your name? Kelsey? Stretch your hands out real quick. Um, um, I, I saw like persistence over you, like a real strong persistence thing, like um, just an unwillingness to give up, uh, an unwillingness to stop, an unwillingness to, to stop believing, and just that there's a real persistence thing in you. And I just saw a crack in the dam. The Lord actually told me, he said, she's about to get flooded. Like, I'm about, I'm about to open the floodgates, but I felt like patience and persistence are really important right now, and that, that you believe that God's about to come, even while you haven't seen the, you haven't seen the manifestation of the promises. I, I, just, I, I just saw persistence, I saw promise, I saw patience, I saw those three things. Like there's promises that the Lord's given you that are going to require persistence and patience. And I saw you living in tension. It was, it was interesting. Like, like the Lord's put a divine dissatisfaction in you. And you've wondered what that is. Like you feel restless inside. There's like a divine dissatisfaction. You're, and, and, but there's a tension because you want to live grateful. You want to live thankful. But you also are, have this dissatisfaction that's stirring on you. And there's promises that you know are coming. But you also, it requires persistence but also patience and I saw you really not knowing how to live in tension but I just want to say your life is going to be tension right now it's going to be the ability to be persistent and the ability to be patient it's the ability to, to say I'm extremely grateful and yet I'm extremely dissatisfied and that you can live in this realm and that the Lord really is I just saw a flood coming your way I just saw like a massive kind of break and and the Lord just told me there's greatness in you uh, you have greatness inside of you I think this is some things that you felt I remember feeling this thing, uh, that there was greatness inside of me, but the timing, you, you're going to feel greatness before the time to manifest. That, that's, that's the weird part, is that you're going to feel there are things inside of you, and the frustration is, Lord, I, why hasn't this thing happened yet? And the Lord said, because the timing's not right. And you're going to feel greatness before it even manifests. And, uh, and, and I just, I just want to tell you, the Lord's going to meet, if you'll go meet with him, he'll meet with you in the secret place. I, I, I heard the Lord very clearly say, if she'll come meet with me, I'm waiting for her. If she'll come meet with me, I am in the secret place waiting for her. And, and I just saw you finding a secret place and just, and just going and walking in and the Lord waiting for you in that place and just wanting to meet with you and speak to you. And I really believe the next 12 months, God wants to speak some things to you that will be the foundational pieces for the rest of your life, that you're going to look back on this next 12 months and say that 12 months, God spoke some things to me that really just, that just uh, uh, directed the rest of my life. And so we just say yes to that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey guys, why don't you stand up with me if you would. Can I just, can I encourage you today? Guard your heart. <laughs> Guard your heart. I, I want to see you live in the fullness of what God has. I want to see you making a difference in the kingdom. I want to see you impacting the world around you. But we have, this is not a season to be careless. It's not a season to be careless. It's a season to be intentional. We are surrounded by voices that are trying, the, the enemy's trying to get in. He's trying to give access. And when you are worn out, just know this, I've got to keep my guard up and I can do something about it. Father, I'm just so grateful for this place. So grateful for this house. I'm so grateful for the testimony of Jesus in this place. Thank you for the radicals, the revivalists that you're raising up in this house. Thank you that you're going to impact New York City. Thank you, God, that what is impossible with man is possible with you. Lord, we just say that you are going to pour out your spirit in this city. God, there's going to be a great harvest in this city. The next Jesus people movement is going to be released in this city. And people may have given up on this city. People may say it's impossible. But we just say, God, we're not with man. We're with you. And all things are possible. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would put faith in the hearts of people. Put faith in the hearts of people. Take just a moment with the Lord, and I'm going to turn this over.